Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Nordhaus. I direct Change the Story Vermont and I am so happy to be here today. It's a, it's a momentous day. We're really excited. It's been uh, 18 months of work with an amazing team. Um, and I'm gonna run through a few housekeeping details while we let a few more folks in. There are 350 of you registered for today's event. So thank you for joining us. It's really, really an impressive. Um, we'd like you to, uh, we'd like to invite you to use the chat to ask your questions as we're going along and the speakers will reply, will answer those questions as they can. There will also be 15 minutes uh, near the end for question and answer. We do have transcription and closed captioning uh, ability. So you can control that in your own screen down in your, um, in the menu bar at the bottom of your Zoom window, if you would like to, um, to turn on captions or a live transcript. If you have any technical questions, um, you can direct message Ezzy Ezerins in the chat, it's Ezzy, and she's gonna help troubleshoot that. We are recording this session, so we wanna let you know that up front. We're gonna um, be able to send it then to folks who couldn't make it, send the recording, but also uh, we may make a little promotional video out of it. So you could be a movie star but likely it will be the speakers who will be movie stars. Um, and then there will be a breakout room for the press immediately following. So if you have questions for any of our panelists or our experts, if you're a member of the media, uh, please message Lily Talbert if you would like to be admitted into that or invited into that breakout room. Um, with that, I would love to pass it over to Kelly Campbell who is a commissioner on the Vermont Commission of Women to welcome you all. Thanks for being here, Kelly. Jessica, thank you so much. A warm welcome to everybody. I am so excited uh, to see how many individuals are joining us today, so a, a thank you. Um, my name is Kelly Campbell, and I am a commissioner with the Vermont Commission on Women. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Vermont Commission on Women, um, we are an independent nonpartisan state government commission advancing the rights and opportunities for Vermont women and girls in our state. Um, and I'm really excited uh, to be here launching our LEAP Toolkit, Leaders for Equity and Equal Pay. You're going to hear a lot about that today. Before we get started, I would like to read a land acknowledgement. We are virtually gathered today across Vermont and beyond. We wish to acknowledge that many of us are on the unceded territory of the original inhabitants of Andakina, the Abenaki. These people of the Donland are the traditional land caretakers. Their relationship to the land calls us to learn to be better caretakers of the land ourselves. We pay our respects to their ancestors who were here for all time, their elders and their relations past, present, and emerging. We honor with gratitude this land and all it gives us. I'm really excited to um, encourage you to take a look at the Equal Pay Compact today. Um, it will definitely thread into today's LEAP conversation, but the Vermont Commission on Women's Equal Pay Compact is a voluntary online pledge enabling Vermont-based employers to learn more about and to indicate a commitment to closing the gender wage gap. Uh, the website, which I will give you the URL to in a moment, and I believe somebody will be putting it in the chat as well, um, offers resources, information, and shares a list of compact signers across our state. We're close to 200, and we hope that number goes up today. The project launched on Equal Pay Day in 2015 to inform employers about practical steps they can take to eliminate the wage gap in their business and across Vermont. And I do hope you will spend a few minutes visiting um, women.vermont.gov to visit uh, the Equal Pay Compact page and learn more. I also would like to introduce Change the Story. Uh, so for the Vermont Commission on Women is one of the partners of Change the Story, but um, Change the Story is spearheaded by three organizations, the Vermont Commission on Women, Vermont Works for Women, and the Vermont Women's Fund. Change the Story Vermont is a multi-year partnership initiative to align philanthropy, policy, and programs to fast track women's economic status in Vermont. And on behalf of the Vermont Commission on Women and many of my colleagues in the room who do this great work every day, I want to 
welcome you. And with that, I will pass it to Ronnie Bastin, the Executive Director of Vermont Works for Women. Hello to all of you. As a proud Change the Story partner, I wanted to extend a huge thank you to the seven businesses who participated and greatly contributed to the LEAP pilot program in 2020. I also want to thank and recognize businesses everywhere who are tackling this important work around pay and gender equity in our workplaces. We are honored to work with many of these businesses through our Trailblazers training programs, creating real change for women in high demand industries across our state. Vermont Works for Women is excited to continually enhance and expand our gender equity supports and stands ready to help impact real systemic change with all of you here. I would now like to introduce Meg Smith with the Vermont Women's Fund and a Change the Story partner. Thank you, Ronnie. Hi, everyone. I'm Meg Smith, director of the Vermont Women's Fund, which is a fund that's the largest, first and largest philanthropic resource in the state of Vermont dedicated to advance women and girls. Began 27 years ago, and six years ago, we funded and continue to fund Change the Story uh, through our partnership in initiative. And it's been a very powerful um, campaign to fast track gender equity in the state of Vermont. And we couldn't be prouder, not only of the, the um, directors of Change the Story, who you'll be hearing from, but um, the work today is really groundbreaking. And it came about actually uh, through an alignment of a group of male identified allies, allies of the Women's Fund and Change the Story who wanted to pursue different avenues of change in trying to advance gender equity. And in conjunction with Sadowski Consulting Services, who you'll hear from today, who was already at work developing this tool and these ideas uh, for Vermont employers, along with Gallagher and Flynn, um, they made this work possible. It all came together in this tremendous kind of wonderful alignment. Um, so we want to thank the male champions for change who got this started really initially, um, I would say five years ago, four years ago, and with Sadowski Consulting Services and Gallagher and Flynn uh, for the creation of this game-changing work. Jessica, I believe it's over to you. You're muted. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that it's been how many months and still I manage to keep myself on mute sometimes. Um, thanks for all of you who are joining us. My name is Jessica Nordhaus. I use she, her pronouns and I direct Change the Story Vermont. We're thrilled to have you all here today. I'm gonna give you uh, a quick high level overview of our agenda. Um, but I wanna thank our, our Change the Story partners, the Commission on Women, the Vermont Women's Fund and Vermont Works for Women uh, who have committed for the last seven years now to um, working together to advance women's economic security. And particularly a shout out to you, Meg, uh, and you're the Women's Fund Council who I feel like we're really visionary in um, funding this, this multi-year strategy and it uh, doesn't happen by accident. Um, so those philanthropic funds were really necessary to get this off the ground. We appreciate that. And should any of you be also so wowed by these efforts that you would like to contribute to the Women's Fund, I'm sure that Meg would gratefully accept your contributions. Um, high level agenda for the day. Change the Story has been doing employer work since 2016 when we um, started the Business Peer Exchange, working with employers, bringing a diverse group of employers together to talk about gender equity in the workplace. Uh, we had four yearly cohorts of the Business Peer Exchange, and one of the aspects of gender equity we talked about in partnership with Frank Sadowski and Krista Sadowski uh, was compensation. And um, then in conjunction with, Meg talked a little bit about the male champs and their interest in working on pay equity, um, but we had conversations at, at the same time with Frank and Krista about developing a cohort model that would address strictly compensation and pay equity issues. Um, and so what 
what happened is Business Peer Exchange uh, evolved into Leaders for Equity and Equal Pay. You're going to hear a little bit more about that, but we had seven organizations in Vermont who came together for a year to work together to help us develop this toolkit. And some of those uh, participating members are here today. You're, you're going to hear from them. Uh, we're, our focus is not just on closing the wage gap, but also building a more equitable community. And I wanna stress here that there isn't just one wage gap. So I'm giving a shout out to the Vermont Commission on Women who this year are uh, very carefully and skillfully and thoughtfully highlighting uh, the, the wage gap for uh, black women, for Latinx and indigenous women, for women living with disabilities, for mothers, for LGBTQIA plus individuals. So it, it that stretches across a year and the, pay gap for most women of color and women in those other identity groups is much larger than it is for white women. So this is a multi-factored approach. We're gonna see, I believe, when we look at the, the data next year, um, we're gonna see our numbers shift and the wage gap might actually look better. Uh, and we might be lulled into thinking that women are doing better economically. Um, but we have to consider the fact that more than 2 million women have left the workforce over the course of the last 16 months. And we've lost a lot of those lower earning jobs, um, which could artificially actually narrow the wage gap. So we're gonna need to look at those numbers carefully going forward. And one way we can do that is by employers really taking an active look under the hood, um, checking out what's going on in your own organizations, and then putting plans in place to support what's going well and to remediate what is needs a little work. I'm really excited to introduce, I didn't get to the high level agenda. We're gonna hear from uh, Evelyn Murphy, who is Zooming in from Boston. I'll introduce Evelyn in just a minute. Um, and then Frank Sadowski and Krista Sadowski are gonna introduce you to the toolkit, um, which is phenomenal. Uh, and then we are going to invite several of our LEAP participants, Dwayne Peterson, Lisa Yeager, and Mara Rivera to talk about their experience with these tools. Uh, and that round table will be moderated by Karen Durfee, who is also a commissioner on Vermont Commission on Women. Uh, there'll be a chance for questions. Please throw your questions in the chat as they occur to you and we will make sure they get to the presenters. Um, and then we'll close it out and at 1 p.m. or a few minutes after one, uh, we will press the button and hit launch on these toolkits. You'll be able to uh, find them at changethestoryvt.org. All the tools will be available for you there to download for free. So I'm gonna move ahead. So happy and honored to have Evelyn Murphy here today. Evelyn is the former Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. In fact, she was the first woman to be elected to statewide office in Massachusetts. She is an economist uh, by training and trade. She is the president of the Wage Project, developed a curriculum for helping women negotiate their salaries. She is co-chair of the Boston Women's Workforce Council, and she is a total force herself in pay equity, wage equity, and power equity. So thrilled, Evelyn, thank you for joining us um, and looking forward to hearing what's going on outside of this brave little state. <laughs> Jess, thank you very much. Um, you know, I am very excited about this event. Uh, the toolkit and the playbook to me could potentially can put Vermont uh, as the national leader on eliminating gender and racial wage gaps. Uh, and, I, and I say that being fiercely proud of what we're doing in Massachusetts to be that same leader. So this has enormous potential. And here's what's going on for you. Um, as a kid, you were probably asked sometime to uh, pat your belly, uh, pat your head and, and rub your belly at the same time. And if you remember doing that, the first time was hard because you're doing two different things at once. But after you did it a couple of times, it became very easy. So my challenge to you today is to do the same thing with this toolkit, which is do two different 
analyses at once. Do the individual analysis of employers pay uh, to detect and, and to eliminate the, uh, the biases in pay and promotion in hiring and in evaluation? That's the focus of a, most of what I think you're gonna talk about this afternoon. But at the same time, do the organizational analysis of your gender and your racial wage gaps using the same data. So do the individual, do the organization over and over again. And that's your practice at patting your head and rubbing your belly at the same time. So why do you need to do the organizational analysis too? All of our life, we've heard reports about the gender wage gap. When I started, the wage gap was 40 cents. Women earned 60 cents for every dollar the men earned. Uh, and I was told at that time, oh, don't worry, you girls will catch up. Uh, you just need to be better educated. You need to work as long and as hard as men. And besides, you'll probably uh, go get married and drop out and have, have and raise kids. Five decades later, women are better educated. <laughs> We, we work as hard as men, we work as long as men, uh, we financially support our families, and yet the gap nationally is still 20 cents. And for over 50 years, the emphasis was, and still is largely, around fixing women. We must get more educated, work more, choose different professions. Uh, even though when we choose different professions, like to become a doctor, male, Doctors get more than female doctors. Male nurses get more than female nurses. So we've done all that. And still there's this 20 cents difference. So you have to ask, what are we missing here? We're missing fixing workplaces as well as fixing women. So for the first five years as the national, uh, <clears throat> the national economy has been stressed strained by a, a limited labor force, employers have turned to fixing workplaces to some extent, uh, particularly the large employers with HR departments who can, who can look at their workplaces and advance women, uh, advance hiring people of color, all of that. And at the same time, business studies documented that, that employers that with diverse leadership uh, tend to be more profitable. And so the business case has been made. But nonetheless, what's clear is that, and what's not clear, is whether all of these business efforts yet have affected the, the racial and the gender wage gaps. So let me be very clear with you today that there's not one study in the United States or in any state that shows that fixing workplaces has reduced the racial or gender wage gap, one penny. Why? Because employers do not manage to reduce these gaps the way they manage to profits and to earnings goals, even knowing the interconnectedness now between those gaps and more profitability. So here's what I've learned, Just said, I've been at this for a long time. I've learned over the last 20 years as a one trick pony, I've been totally focused on this eliminating the wage gap. Some of the most prominent CEOs in Boston have routinely said to me, oh, Evelyn, I'm the good guy. I pay my women employees like my male employees. Your problem is those other CEOs. As Lindsay said, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Boston Women's, Mayor's Work, Women's Workforce Council. The council is a public private partnership with the mayor of the mayor with employers who sign 100% talent compact. When they sign that compact, they pledge that they will look under their roof if they have a wage gap, do something about it. And every other year report their racial and their gender wage gaps anonymously. Now we've gone through a couple reporting cycles. Most recently in 2017, the compact signers reported a 24 cent gender wage gap. In 2019, two years later, that gap was not, did not close. And in fact, it got bigger. It went from 24 to 30 cents. And these are the good guys. And the racial wage gaps are even worse. So what's happening? 
executives believe that they don't have they don't have wage gaps when they pay their women and their and their employees of color the same as they pay their male employees for the same or similar jobs but that the pay equity law was signed in 1964 and that's just one component of the racial and the gender wage gaps you see the the gender and the racial wage gaps measure average earnings they don't compare worker one worker with another the gender wage gap compares average earnings of all women with the average earnings of all men and the racial wage gap compares the average earnings of all people of color with all white men so that's what i meant when i said you have to analyze the organization as well as the individuals calculate those averages manage to those averages and to the individual comparisons because one helps you eliminate the biases in your workplace and the other helps you reduce your wage gaps and vermont's wage gaps so that's the critical distinction here now when i switch to massachusetts we, we've taken a, a different but very complementary st strategy to what you're doing here in massachusetts we we discovered we learned that anonymous reporting hasn't really resulted in progress on these wage gaps so many of us believe that employer transparency of their racial and their gender wage gaps is essential so last year we tried to get employers to do this voluntarily to report and only a handful agreed so this year a bill has been fired filed in the state legislature requiring employers with 100 and more employees to publicly report their gender and their racial wage and power gaps annually this transparency creates some accountability among employers and also this reporting is foundational to eliminating an unconscionable racial wealth gap in massachusetts so note that i said this this bill requires to report wage and power gaps now the power gap is the racial and gender representation among the highest earners and it's essential that you track those as well so and here's why the wage and lindsay sort of tipped this off earlier the wage gap compares averages and there are two ways to improve an average gap there's the right way which is you raise the the uh, the earnings of women and people of color and you raise them up and therefore the average moves up because there are more people earning more there's a wrong way which is you drop off the low earning women women of color and and in doing that firing laying off furloughing whatever the average of those who remain goes up as well but and that's what probably has happened with the she session in this pandemic so if you're hearing these stories that we've made progress this year or 2020 on the wage gaps it may be for the, all the wrong reasons because of that dropping off so don't be fooled now our country desperately needs structural change that eliminates racial and gender biases in the workplace and our nation also needs ceos who measure and manage to eliminate their racial and gender wage gaps, both. This toolkit and the playbook give Vermont employers the means to accomplish both of these things. Your challenge is going to be getting enough, a, a large number of employers to do this, to use these resources, to show the nation that gender and racial wage gaps can be eliminated in the next 10 years and not the 50 to 100 years that the experts now predict it will take. So prove these experts wrong and go for it with these tools. Thanks, Lindsay. Back to you. Thanks so much, Evelyn. We really appreciate it. Wise words. And um, I'm sure that I saw a lot of activity uh, in the chat um, happening. So I think you've given us a lot to think about and potentially to ask about. Um, let's hear a little bit about what this toolkit is. You've, you have all heard us referencing it. Um, and I would like to invite Frank Sadowski and Krista Sadowski uh, to come on stage and 
give us a tour. And I believe Krista has some slides to show us. Great, thanks Jess. And thank you, Evelyn, um, really for all of your groundbreaking work in pay equity. Those of us that stand on your shoulders owe you a great deal of gratitude, so thank you. Um, and thank you all out there in this virtual audience for being here today. We are so thrilled to be releasing this toolkit into the world and to you all today. And you get to say you saw it here first. Um, so thank you for being here. We're just tremendously excited. Um, my goal in the next few minutes is to kind of tell you just a little bit about where this toolkit came from, who should use it, what's actually inside the toolkit, um, and we're going to take a sneak peek inside, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, admittedly the far wiser half of Sadowski Consulting Services, my dad Frank Sadowski, who's going to share some concrete examples of the types of information um, and insights that can be gained from using the toolkit. So this is where we actually get a little bit more, more tactical. Um, please feel free to pop questions in the chat as we go, um, and I'll touch what we can, and um, we can cover anything else in the Q&A at the end. Excellent. So where did this all come from? Um, Frank has been doing compensation and business ethics work in the region for more decades than I'm allowed to say here, um, and I had the great honor of joining him um, about five years ago. And at the same time, we have so many amazing companies in Vermont that have a long history of leading or more often really trailblazing when it comes to developing and implementing pre yes, pre best practices. Um, and yet we saw so many of Vermont's companies being left behind when it came to pay equity assessments simply as a result of their size. Um, we know that pay equity assessments are really rapidly becoming standard practices for leading companies in the US, but the methods that are typically used really rely on large numbers of people so you can use a regression analysis. And there simply hadn't been much work done to date to standardize methods and make them easily accessible to small companies. The problem, of course, is the majority of our amazing companies in Vermont are about 93% are small companies. So our trailblazers, our movers and shakers were being left behind in this critical movement, again, purely on account of their size. Um, so we really set out um, to develop um, a standard framework uh, for small to mid-sized companies, but more importantly, to find a way to teach our trailblazers how to conduct their own assessments so that they could build these practices more deeply into their core DNA and not be reliant on consultants forever. Because we know real change really occurs when these practices are baked fully into kind of standard operating procedures. Um, and give me just two seconds to really geek out for a minute on kind of why pay equity assessments are really rapidly on the rise and becoming part of standard practices. This is no longer like a one in a million kind of moonshot part of, of leading companies work. This really is um, a standard practice for our leading companies. And the reason for this is that pay really communicates from a company to its employees um, what it values and whether it's living its values. And by assessing pay equity, um, it is such a critical tool for ensuring that a company's DEI strategy is having its intended impact. You know, oftentimes our intent and our impact don't always align um, and a lot of damage can be done with that misalignment. Um, and the really awesome thing is that um, compensation sits at the nexus of so many of our other critical people systems, um, including kind of hiring, performance evaluations, performance promotions, and of course, compensation. So by assessing pay equity, we can actually reveal kind of doing a health check on what's working and where areas of improvement are across all of these critical people systems. And ultimately, I think one thing that's really important to note, this isn't about like shaming or blaming or rooting out the troublemakers. Doing an assessment is just as much an opportunity to highlight what's going right and to celebrate that success with your employees, your stakeholders, and having the hard data to tell that joyful story of why your company is truly a leader um, in the field and a best place to work. Um, and then of course, also offering that insights of where more attention needs to be, to be given to ensure that you're living uh, your mission and your values. Um, we know that inequitable pay, pay systems just have this insidious and toxic effect on companies and if left unattended can really greatly undermine all of the other good efforts um, around creating diverse and inclusive teams, building engagement and trust. Um, so this is a piece that I would argue you kind of can't afford not to take a look at 
um, because it really is the groundwater that's feeding so much of your other culture and engagement work. So anyway, off my soapbox, I apologize. Um, so kind of recognizing this gap, we really set out to help standardize this framework and toolkit, enter our amazing partners at Change the Story who agreed to bring their expertise to the table in um, helping shape this program um, to run a pilot program. Uh, they had brought incredible expertise from having run a really successful business peer exchange program on gender equity previously that we used as this model for how to shape the program and then overlaying uh, the pay equity expertise on top. So we launched a one-year pilot with seven fabulous trailblazing courageous companies. We held eight sessions, half day training sessions over the course of the year in which tons of incredible peer knowledge sharing took place. Um, companies were trained on how to conduct their own pay equity assessments and assess the results. And then um, really just countless tests and iterations of the tools and resources that have since been compiled um, and into this toolkit that we're presenting here today. So a huge thank you to our seven brave companies for being um, the guinea pigs and learning, learning in action with us. Um, to, into our fabulous partners. And I would be remiss in not mentioning um, Mail Champs for Change, Neil Lundeville um, at Vermont Gas for his incredible leadership in helping launch this, Dwayne Peterson for asking us for over two years when this program was gonna launch and our many other business leaders that stepped so courageously into this space. So who should use it? Uh, the toolkit really is for small to medium sized businesses. So I'd say kind of anybody under about 400 employees above 400, you can start using that regression analysis methods. Um, number four, uh, new companies. Um, you don't have to be at it for a long time. It is such an advantage to bake this into your core DNA right from the start, easier to do prevention than it is actually to fix. Um, so this toolkit can be used um, preventatively and kind of from a best practice uh, from day one perspective. Um, and then of course for established companies at well, those who wanna kind of see what's working and see what needs to be tuned up. Um, and then lastly, well, pay equity assessments are typically led, most often our, our kind of lead clients are sitting in the, either the HR or the CEO's office. There is so much good information on here just around communicating about equity issues, um, kind of bringing your team together and other tools that are useful that I'd recommend it for anybody that's really touching equity issues in their company. Okay, so what's actually in it? We've been talking about the toolkit, but we have no idea what's actually inside. Um, there are two main components. There is an incredible, beautifully illustrated playbook, thanks to our fabulous designer, Courtney, um, that was written uh, with hundreds, I dare say, of pro bono hours from, Saint, from, from Frank, a huge debt of gratitude there, um, and editing help from Jess and Al, which has been incredible. Um, and really is a step-by-step -step guide to independently conduct uh, pay equity assessments on an ongoing basis. Um, tons of tools and resources in there as well. Um, and then the second big component is an actual, um, the equity management tool, which is a big old Excel kind of plug and play where you can actually input your individual company data um, and get back a whole series of um, charts that will help reveal the picture of how you're doing. And Frank's gonna give you an example of those in a few minutes. Um, so two really great core components there. Um, I won't read the slide, but just as a sneak peek of all the great content and it's inside, and you can see it really starts with the nuts and bolts um, to help everybody get grounded in, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about gender inequity? What do we mean when we're talking about pay equity? All the way through to um, the step-by-steps for using the, the um, the equity management tool, and then a whole series of templates and resources at the end. Here's just a little sneak peek again at the insides of the guts of the playbook. Um, really accessible uh, layout or really uh, hope that you'll find it tremendously useful. And I've mentioned a few times that there are lots of resources available on the inside, everything from a compensation philosophy worksheet, an entire template for putting your pay equity plan together, um, I mentioned a few minutes ago that really pay equity sits at the nexus of so many of your people systems um, and performance management and actually tying compensation to performance is a place that we often see companies aspiring to go, but kind of asking that question of, of how do we actually get there? So we've provided um, our kind of performance rubric that we, that we like to implement with um, our clients and that's been uh, included in the playbook. And then also a hot off the press, a step-by-step -step user guide for using the Excel tool. 
So really, this is not a playbook that's just going to kind of tell you to go go get more information. Everything that you need to complete um, an analysis is inside. Um, lastly, I think this, this playbook is really designed um, to help companies. We know one of the big challenges for small companies in doing these assessments can be the financial barrier to bringing on an outside consultant. So our goal here is, is not to give a fish like in the consulting model, but really to, to teach organizations how to fish so that this can be baked in um, to core DNA and, and done on a repeated basis. Finally, um, we've been talking a little bit about how regression analysis is used for uh, large companies. A COMPA ratio is the main tool for doing pay equity analyses with, with small to mid-sized companies. And a COMPA ratio is simply um, an individual's uh, wage or salary over the, the midpoint of the pay range. So a quick example at the bottom, Sally, if the, if the pay range is 60 to 80,000 um, and Sally's making 65, uh, at her, her COMPA ratio would be 65 divided by 70 or 93%. We can then compare COMPA ratios if Sally's at 93% and Tom um, is higher in the range, we can take those compensation or those COMPA ratios and we can chart them out to be able to see how employees are comparing um, on where they fall in the pay range next to each other and then assess that based on different variables. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that the, the Excel tool is really designed to actually look at different dimensions of diversity, whether that's um, race, gender, disability status, veteran status. Um, so however your uh, kind of diversity and equity and inclusion plan is trying to drive um, change in your organization, and the tool can be um, incredibly useful. So with that, I will turn it over to the mastermind of Frank. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, the equity management tool, or EMT for short, uh, was created to help people quickly see uh, where there may be potential pay equity issues in a company. Uh, version one was created by Sadowski Consulting Services in 2020 for the pilot project. Uh, the staff at Gallagher Flynn and Company worked with us earlier this year to upgrade the tool and make it a lot more user, user friendly. So now version 2.0 is available with the playbook and the other materials just mentioned. As it was said, in big companies with lots of employees in each position, the numbers are there to do really good statistical, excuse me, statistical comparisons of how men and women are being paid and discover the differences in pay between those two groups if one exists. Uh, for small companies, whether there may be just a few people or even just one with the same job title, however, you don't have that, uh, the numbers to do anything that's statistically significant. Uh, but uh, by using compa ratios, we can compare the pay of employees across jobs and ask whether their pay is consistent with the company's compensation philosophy. Uh, the EMT can be used in two ways, as an investigative tool or as a predictive tool. In other words, it can help you see if you have a current problem and it can also help you see and avoid potential equity problems in the future that would be caused by a round of pay increases. Let me just show you how the tool can be used to investigate current problems. So imagine this situation. A company's been sold, there are new owners, and all of the old senior management is gone. So there's no one who can tell uh, anybody why people are being paid the way they are. A new HR manager uh, is trying to figure that out. And uh, she comes in. And because she found some performance review scores in the file, she thought there might be some kind of a merit pay system that was driving pay. So she starts to use the EMT and starts with a small group of employees. For instance, here, all of the shippers and receivers uh, in the company to different departments. And in this chart, now, performance review scores increase as you go from left to right on the x-axis and compass ratios increase on the y-axis. So if pay increases are based on performance, the chart should, should, should so show a steady increase from the lower left as you're looking at the chart into the upper right. But when the HR manager creates the chart, 
that's not what she gets. You can see that some employees with lower performance review scores are being paid significantly more than some employees with a much higher performance review scores. So from this chart, it doesn't look like performance is the major driver of pay differences for these uh, two groups. Next slide. So next, she decides to look at company tenure uh, and uh, its time with the company and race to see if they have an impact. Again, company tenure is on the, y, the uh, x-axis. Uh, race, you can see, is built into the chart. So you have the uh, black and white uh, employees. With this chart, you can see a trend from lower left to upper right, but race doesn't seem to be a differentiator. Time with the company is clearly influencing pay. So that explains a good bit of why the chart looks like the way it does, but it doesn't describe everything because there are situations in, in this chart where people with the same number of years of experience are paid differently. So she decides to look specifically at company tenure and gender. And <clears throat> there we are. Uh, and you'll see that again on the x-axis, you've got years of experience uh, and you've got the first names of the employees. <clears throat> now, company tenure is clearly the primary factor influencing pay, but this chart shows some problems. Look closely and you'll see that wherever a man and a woman or someone who identifies as non-binary have the same time with the company, the man is paid more than either the woman or the non-binary person. Clearly, there's a significant problem here, but how far does it extend? She realizes that both the shippers and the receivers had the same manager who's already left the company. And uh, um, so next slide. She now adds all of, the, uh, all of the other departments that reported to that same manager. And when she does this, she sees that she has a very pervasive pattern. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that all of the, uh, the men who are in red are paid more than the women or non-binary folks with the same number of years of experience. And then from there, she continues to look at her now at, at other departments to see if the problem is company-wide or if there are other issues elsewhere in the company. She's used the tool to quickly find out a great deal about how people are actually being paid rather than accepting any one statement of how it was done. And she can see the scope of the problem and then figure out how to fix it. In the playbook, there are many other examples of the kinds of things that you can find uh, and, and use the tool for. We hope it will help companies recognize issues before people leave or sue because they feel like they were not treated fairly. Uh, and um, we hope it can lead to very, very targeted solutions uh, and again, using the knowledge that exists in small companies about your individual employees and your individual departments. Thanks, back to you, Krista. Awesome, thanks so much, Frank. And we'll hand it over, that's just our Super quick sneak peek at the tool and the playbook itself, and we hope you take a chance to uh, hop online later today and check it out in more detail. Jess. Thanks so much, Frank and Krista. Uh, we could listen for hours. We've um, only got an hour, and in fact, we got started a little late, so I'm just going to let everyone know that we're going to stay on uh, about 10 minutes after one. Uh, hopefully you can join us. If you can't, we will have um, the recording available to you. And please keep the questions coming in the chat. We've seen some questions coming up for the Sadowski team and um, they will be back in a few minutes to start to answer some of those. Um, you can probably see over my shoulder, the equal pay jersey on the wall and uh, wanted to give a shout out to the Burlington High School girls soccer team who several years ago uh, went just a little bit viral in the good way um, and created a worldwide sensation around their equal pay movement. Change of Story was proud to support them in those efforts. 
And in lots of ways that has led us to where we are today. So thank you. You'll see a, a few equal pay jerseys in the crowd as well. Um, Karen Durfee is a commissioner with the Vermont Commission on Women and she is the newly appointed Director of Human Resources for the City of Burlington. And Karen, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off with our participant roundtable. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thanks for inviting me to moderate. Um, it's, we could talk all day. So I'm gonna try to be efficient with my time and introduce our uh, three roundtable panelists. Um, first, we have uh, Lisa Yeager. Uh, she's the Chief of Equity, People and Culture at Vermont Food Bank. Um, Mara Neufeld Rivera, and she is the Head of People and Culture at Chroma Technologies and Dwayne Peterson, President and Co-Founder of Sun Common. Um, so I, I think I'll just start um, we're going to ask you to take two or three minutes, each of you, and tell us, you know, what your experience is with the Equal Equity and Equal Pay Pilot Program, and how this toolkit was used to serve your organizations. Um, I think we'll start with you, Dwayne. Um, let's just—I can't see you, but <laughs> I think we'll start with you. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little about about why you got involved with Leap. Sure. Uh, what a great crowd! Thanks for turning out. So. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Sun Common. We're a public benefit corporation and a certified B Corp uh, powered by about 200 employees these days. And so as a values-led business, we are committed to using the business as a force for good. And so of course, pay equity, uh, maybe I shouldn't mansplain to this crowd why pay equity is important, but it was, it was a priority of ours. And so we on our own, you know, searched out some of the obvious best practices gosh, let's you know, in, improve the pool of candidates beyond what we would get just by running ads, or let's be sure that, let's try, let's try to be sure that we, we don't interview until we've got a diverse pool. We tried to put uh, diversity into the hiring teams. Uh, we created pay grades. We, we, we tried to do, and let's be clear, with fits and starts, and we've got a long way to go, but we tried to do some of the obvious things but as a business, you know, there's the aphorism what uh, you can only manage what you measure. And so it dawned on us that, you know, we might be swell, well-meaning people, uh, but uh, as we heard before, intent is not the same as impact. And so we wanted, we wanted to measure. And so uh, hooking up with our friends that changed the story, whom we met and learned to revere through the business peer exchange uh, and the mail, champions of change, I didn't name that, but it's a great group. Um, we were part of the early cohort, um, the, the so-called guinea pigs who got this ball rolling. And it was just fantastic to be a part of that, to learn from it, uh, to commiserate with other people who have day jobs and are really <laughs> crushed trying to fill their own vacancies, um, but while adding uh, uh, equity. And so for us, we got into it selfishly, we wanted the help, but then quickly we were really excited about if we're gonna spend the time, effort, brain cells, some money to do this, let's, let's make this available to others. And so I'm totally stoked that we can try as we can to improve uh, the positive impact within the four walls of our business. But if we can make it that much more available to spread farther uh, and faster, then that's even better. And so I'm completely happy that we're launching this today. And I hope every person on this meeting uh, grabs this and runs with it in meaningful ways. Thank, thanks so much, Dwayne. And I should say that um, to people listening, you will have, um, there is a Q&A after this. So we'll uh, hand it over and, and talk to Lisa Yeager. Um, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about how these tools work for you at Vermont Food Bank? Sure. So um, as Dwayne said, we were part of the cohort that started in January of 2020. Seems like a lifetime ago now. And uh, our first step was really to create our compensation philosophy for the food bank. And our emphasis was on transparency, as we've talked about before. And all during our process, as we went through the LEAP year cohort together, our emphasis um, was on transparency and communicating with our staff. So as we created our compensation philosophy, we 
we release that to the staff, to our uh, DEI resource team, to our organizational resource team, which is our shared leadership group. And we asked for feedback on everything from the language to the sentence structure. And what we heard, um, the feedback that we heard was that instead of using the term total compensation, folks wanted us to use pay and benefits because that felt like a more accessible term. So, um, you know, we took that feedback and then we engaged Gallagher Flynn, um, who was an enormous, enormously helpful partner in this process because they did a salary review for us based on every single job description. And we were able to see um, what does our comp ratio look like? Um, you know, what we discovered was that we actually didn't have a gender or a racial equity problem in our salaries, but what we did see is that supervisor, um, the way that a supervisor would advocate for an employee or for their particular department could really influence salary structures across the organization. And we could see a disparity based on how, how much the supervisor would advocate for certain people or for certain groups. And so we know we have work to do. Um, and the, the most recent step we've taken to address our issues is by creating a compensation committee. And that's made up of a, a group of individuals across the organization. We're representative of location, of demographic information, of exempt and non-exempt. And we are going to engage an equity consultant to help us look at what the information that Gallagher Flynn has given us, as well as our own use of the EMT. And we know, again, that we have work to do, but engaging our staff throughout the whole process and being incredibly transparent with them, I think has been key to getting buy-in and for building that trust that we're trying to do the right thing. Excellent. I feel uh, the need to ask many questions as the incoming HR director for the city. Uh, we will <laughs> have many, hopefully we'll have many conversations to come. Um, well, you know, turning to you, Mara, um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, what happens? Um, you know, who should use this tool and how do we engage in this process? Great. Thanks, Karen. Great to be here and great to see so many people on this webinar. It's awesome. Um, first, I just want to um, back up a little bit and uh, very briefly be uh, about my experience um, in the cohort and the LEAP pilot program in the past year. Um, so uh, Frank, uh, Frank Sadowski had reached out to me asking me to join the program and very excited from a personal perspective. You know, I wanted to learn more about that. Frank and I have um, worked together um, over the years uh, with other organizations um, and pay equity was very close to my heart. However, I was a bit hesitant um, to join the program. Um, and here's why I, I didn't, I wasn't convinced that Chroma, the organization that I work with, would benefit from it. And here's why. Um, Chroma's uh, compensation philosophy is quite unique. Um, they pay on a, a egalitarian basis, meaning uh, salary increases every year are not based on performance or on merit. Um, they uh, uh, pay a, a flat uh, amount every year, regardless of title. And so um, just, you know, thinking about that tool, I'm already like, well, I'm not sure it's going to show anything different. If, you know, everyone is paid the same, there is not going to be any differentiation. So I wonder if there's going to be benefit, but I joined anyway. And to my surprise, um, after using the tool, uh, the, the AMT tool, there there were a few outliers. Uh, outliers in general, we did the regression analysis showed exactly what I anticipated. Not much, not much differentiation at all. We are doing very well on pay equity for both gender and race, but there were a few outliers. Uh, outliers again um, that I didn't anticipate, and it, it had me ask the question: What is going on here, and could there be? Uh, disparate impact in the future if I didn't catch this and it continued. So I, I think my message for the audience is if you think, oh, I'm a small organization, I've got this down, I know how everybody is paid, I am not seeing any differentiation or, or wage gaps. 
try the tool because it's free and it's worth the effort um, to catch things that you just didn't anticipate. Um, so that's what was such an eye opener and, and wonderful for me. Um, in terms of where we go from here, um, so I'm originally from New York City. I've been in Vermont for 13 years. When I was in New York, I worked for billion dollar international organizations that had their HR departments had centers of excellence. So they had compensation experts who were statisticians and had large amounts of data and can spend their entire careers on this stuff. Here in Vermont, I mean, some companies are lucky to just have one HR professional wearing many different hats. They don't have time to, to, to become comp experts. So what's great about this tool is that it's so easy to use. It does so much of the work for you that you can spend less of your time on data crunching and more on what's the story looking. It does all the analysis for you. So it's like, what am I missing here? Um, just makes our job so much easier. Um, how do we engage people in the process? If you are not at the uh, leadership level, if let's say you're an HR professional and you need to get the attention of a C-suite of how this is important, um, two recommendations. One, um, it's, it's important for you to know that equitable pay helps attract the best employees. It reduces turnover and increases commitment, um, increases productivity and creativity. Most, most HR people know this, they get it, right? So you can say that to C-suite leaders who perhaps are just focused on the bottom line. It sounds nice. They want to see the data. And so part what HR professionals need to do or anybody in, who's interested in pay equity is they have to increase their credibility to the C-suite. So, and, and by doing that, they have to show the data. Um, that's where the story is. Um, so yes, it increases creativity, but show me how it does. And that's what's so great about this tool is that they give us the credibility by showing us, giving us the data that we can then present to leaders um, increases our credibility. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Karen. No, thank you. I'm really excited to have this group with us. And I think, um, I mean, I could ask my own questions. I've written down several. Um, I know that we probably have questions from our folks in um, that are attending. So I think uh, this is a good time to transition to, um, it's gonna be a round table Q and A. Uh, it's gonna be interesting. This will be the first one that I've ever done virtually. Um, so I think um, there's gonna be questions via chat for Frank, Krista and Evelyn and any of our panelists. Um, so I think we can unmute the roundtable participants if folks are muted. And what questions do we have? I know Frank's been busy in the chat. I'm looking. All right, so I'll ask another question. Um, so we know the pandemic has really hit women disproportionately hard. Can these tools help us build a more equitable economy rather than just returning to the status quo? And anybody on the round table can answer that. Uh, yes, I think it can. Um, companies are gonna have a real challenge uh, with women re-entering the, the, the workforce and are gonna to have to think about uh, how they choose to pay them, what, that, uh, what those salary offers are going to be. Uh, and I think the, uh, the tools uh, in this toolkit um, can help people think about that in hopefully in new ways, uh, <clears throat> looking at the skills uh, and abilities of those uh, people rather than simply, you know, time, time in seat uh, and, and uh, years of experience. Yeah, let, let me add to what Frank just said. Um, it, it's, it's important, I think, that women who are laid off or furloughed are not punished for that. Uh, they didn't cause the pandemic. And it seems to me, therefore, it's important that when companies look at bringing back some of the workers that they may have laid off or fired or furloughed, um, that these women not be punished. Secondly, 
I'd always keep in mind how to also keep pulling women up, people of color up this power gap as well. If you do both things at once, bring back the women who were laid off and look at how you're going to add even more leaders of different, uh, of different genders and, and color, uh, then I think you've done, you, you've more than, you've, you've compensated for the pandemic in a very interesting way. So, so I'd, I'd urge a kind of double lens here of restoring and not punishing women for what they had no control over in this, in this uh, pandemic, but also, um, and childcare is gonna be essential. Uh, so. There is a piece in the playbook about the, um, the promotion gap, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the main uh, reasons for the, the pay gap, the pay equity gap. And um, people ought to take a look at that because that's one of the most important things to change in companies to get it right. If you're hiring men and women of uh, equal ability and expertise, there's no reason why you shouldn't be promoting them at the same rate. Uh, and um, uh, you've got to ask what's going on within your company if that's not the case. Yeah, that's huge. And it's a very important point. It, that's, that's taking the, the biases out of the workplace. I'll just add on to that, Evelyn, and that that's one of the places that we see unconscious bias showing up just so tremendously. We tend to promote men for potential and women for proven ability, um, which can lead to multi-year gaps. And when we approve, um, you know, a senior manager is being ready for a promotion to a director um, because of that kind of bias that we carry with us. Yeah. So we've got a question in the chat for our panelists. Um, does, the, does the toolkit look at other systems that impact folks uh, most impacted by the wage gap, such as access to childcare, paid leave, and et cetera? Sorry, Karen, can you repeat the question? Sure, it says, do the, does the toolkit look at other systems that impact folks most impacted by the wage gap, such as access to childcare, paid leave, et cetera? I'm so glad that this question came up. Um, the toolkit focuses primarily on what is um, immediately inside a company's sphere of influence. That said, we know that there are bigger societal systemic barriers and issues at play here that as leaders in this space, we hope that our company leadership will continue to step um, more deeply into and taking a stance like our courageous leaders have today with Lisa and Duane and Mara of, um, taking a stance um, on this, stepping into the policy sphere, working with folks like Evelyn. Um, so there is work to be done um, on those broader systemic issues as well. Uh, but the playbook does focus, gives a nod and does have some good tools for that, but does focus primarily on what can we fix within our own four walls. Thanks for that. And one more question from the chat. Um, does the toolkit have the ability to assess whether women are promoted at the same rate as men? <laughs> See, assuming equal reviews. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yes, and is the answer to that. There is a whole section on promotions in there and, and the ability to look at that. But there, um, well, Frank, I'll let you answer that. Well, there's a discussion of that in the playbook. Um, the tool itself, um, I think you can get some information from it, but it won't, it doesn't directly um, address that or kind of keep track of the, uh, of the numbers. And Karen, there's a really important question in the chat of what is the cost to use the toolkit? And I am so grateful to be able to share that this is a free resource. It will be live online this afternoon. Um, and that is with just tremendous gratitude to all of those that have contributed their, their time, treasure and talents to make that possible. Excellent, yeah, I did see that question and I'm glad somebody asked. We can't say free enough. This is a free <laughs> toolkit. It's a, you know, it, and it's definitely, um, I, I'm excited to see it go live online myself because <laughs> I need it. <laughs> um, but uh, we're gonna ask a question for Evelyn. Evelyn, I know that, that we have a lot of legislators here today. What would you say to policymakers about their role in closing the wage pay and power gaps? Oh. <laughs> I can go off on a rant on this one. Look, as I, as I said earlier, I think this issue of transparency and God bless the millennials for, for emphasizing this, but transparency is so important here. And if you're doing the right things, you don't mind being transparent about what your wage gaps or racial 
and, and gender wage gaps are. So I, what I would hope is that policymakers begin this discussion and see some legislation that helps us all at the, at the level of every organization, every business, whatever, being transparent and forthright about what their gaps are and what their practices are. So, so to me, that's the next big step <clears throat> in our agenda. And, and I have to say, I mean, if we don't do this, what I love about this discussion is that it's positive and it is constructive. But there are other states like California and Illinois that are beginning to move on requiring reporting, which is strict and it's not going to be made public. It's, it's really to prosecute. And, and I just think that's not the right way to go right now. We can do more with this constructive way of challenging each other to do better than by that kind of legislation. So if we don't get out in front of this, I think you're gonna see a lot of, of, the, of the heavier hammer of public policy. Thank, thanks so much for that, Evelyn. I really appreciate it. Krista, I mean, our time is short, but I do have to ask you the next question. What's the next step? What's the next first step folks should take? <laughs> Yes, I know we've shared a ton of information today and it can be easy to kind of leave here smiling and nodding and then um, kind of put it on a shelf and forget about it. Um, so I encourage you all to do three things. First, hop on the website, download the, the tool and the playbook this afternoon um, and, and use it as a fabulous resource. Second and most critically, um, gain leadership buy-in um, on the importance of this work. This work um, can't go anywhere unless it is led from the top. And we are so excited to have been able to spotlight some examples of courageous leadership in this space today. So have the conversation with your leaders. If you are the leaders, take this on. Assign somebody within your organization to lead the charge. Um, we know that people are busy. And if it doesn't sit housed within and employees kind of scope of responsibility, it's easy to get distracted um, and for other fires to pop up. So really build this into somebody's um, strategic priorities for the coming year. Uh, so that's two, that's actually three. Download the playbook, gain executive buy-in and, and assign leadership within your organization um, and have fun getting to work. Um, we'd love to hear from you as you dive in. We'd love your continued feedback um, on the tool and, and excited to hear how it goes for you and your organization. Thanks, Karen. Awesome, thank you so much. I, I wanna thank the roundtable participants, um, Duane, Mara, um, and Lisa for, for coming. I know we were really crunched on time, but um, you know, Evelyn, thank you so much for your remarks. I mean, it, again, we could go on all day. Um, if you haven't done it, the first next step is to sign the Equal Pay Compact. Um, I'm gonna hand things back to Jessica and Al from Ch Change the Story. You're muted, Jessica. I did it again. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you all um, to, to all our panelists, presenters and attendees. Thanks for your patience and sticking around for an extra 14 minutes. I know some of you had to leave. We still have 100, over 125 people on the line, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, we, Al and I at Change the Story um, are, have had such a rich experience partnering with these folks uh, to bring this to life. And we are underslept, but very grateful um, to have it out the door and to have it to you this afternoon. So we would love to get back to you with all these amazing questions that have come in the chat. Um, we will work on doing that through your Zoom contact information that you entered when you registered. Um, if you have other questions that come up, you can reach us at info at changethestoryvt.org and we can forward questions on um, to Frank or Krista or Evelyn or any of our participants. Um, so I'm going to double up on, on Karen's thanks and also another round of appreciation for the commissioners who led us through. Jessica, Ow. before we say goodbye, if I could yeah. just do a quick plug. Oh, please. Thank you. Um, just to jump on, uh, on this great webinar, uh, on September 15th, uh, the uh, SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, uh, is going to have a twin state annual conference 
for both Vermont and New Hampshire. And we are gonna be taking a deeper dive into the, the LEAP tool and the playbook. Um, so for anybody out there who wants to understand more about it or needs uh, additional guidance on how actually to use the tool, we're gonna to be doing more of that there. So stay tuned for more information on that. Thank you. Great, thanks for that reminder, Mara. And if you'll um, throw that link in the chat, that'll be great. We'll get that back out to people with follow-up. I have one more thank you, which is uh, to my teammate and colleague, Al Johnson Kurtz, who is an incredible communications director, uh, very savvy uh, web developer, uh, a late night uh, worker editor, <laughs> brilliant strategist. Um, thank you for, for all you've done to help help carry this through. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, so grateful for all of you joining us today. What an amazing event. Uh, we had over 250 people join us today, so wow. And as we transition now, I just wanna invite any of the press to join us for a few minutes with the panelists in a breakout room. If you are a member of the press, a reporter, please uh, direct message Lily Talbert, who is the, um, works for the Vermont Commission on Women, and we will join you in that breakout room to answer any questions just for press. Um, so thank you again, so grateful for uh, a wonderful event. Take care, everyone.